Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me are two key contributors, Chesto and Steve. Hello, oh. guys. Oh. Um, this week, we're analysing Hyundai's next market frontier with Toyota's Land Cruiser, no less, in its sights. Um, we'll share our thoughts on some recent entrance to the Cars Guide garage, and we'll check in on how close Elon came to dropping the Tesla ball in this week's Musquatch. So stay with us. But first, we have had some feedback. And last week, uh, the guys were talking about cars that maybe could be doing better, were expected to be doing better in market here in Australia, but somehow have failed to fire. Um, and more recently, I think the Mustangs come back a little bit in sales and the Stinger, so much hype before the Kia Stinger arrived in market. And uh, yes, you see them around, but maybe not as many as were um, expected. Yep. And Blake Swan, I'm thinking his nickname has got to be Lakey. Um, or Black Swan. Uh, yeah, Blake, well, Swan Lake. Thank you, thank you, thank you for doing an episode talking about actual cars and not utes. Uh, love <laughs> hearing, the, dis love hearing <laughs> the discussion of Mustang versus Stinger. Great show, guys. So thank you very much, Lakey. Now, Bendigo Pipe Club. And when, I, when Bendigo Pipe Club comes in, I'm... I'm scratching my head as to what kind of club or what kind of pipe. Um, but he says, what's the ANCAP rating for the Mustang? And Senior Bob came in and actually did our job for us and gave him chapter and verse on that um, mm -hmm. and said that the Mustang was tested initially in 2017. It scored two and a half stars. It didn't have things like lane keeping assist, AEB, uh, active cruise, those kinds of things. And also there was a bit of a problem with the rear passenger survival space. Um, he claims that that's why uh, Porsche and Merck and others don't submit two-door coupes to, to ANCAP or others, which is an interesting... Um, a fair point, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, I did do a bit of digging around. I could find a C-Class coupe um, Euro ANCAP had, had numbers for, but that's an interesting uh, point. Um, however, 2018 onwards, it got all that tech and got four stars. Um, and then he says on the Stinger, uh, if you want family space, that's the Stinger. If the Mustang is more for putting a smile on your, your face every time you drive it and people love them. And um, Andrew D actually came in and said, yeah, he, he thinks that the Mustang is actually continually safety bashed um, and that he's, yeah. he's one actually. He's got a bullet, that 2018 limited edition. Um, he loves its rawness. It's manual. Um, he loves the mongrel, you know, brawn. His kids are all adults, so who cares? And um, he's got a Skoda superb four-wheel drive wagon anyway, um, which he says is a luxury Sleeper, so Harpy's luck. Um, fantastic, fantastic. Can I interject for just one moment on the feedback for a second? Because I want to start a campaign and I want the viewers of this fine or listeners of this fine podcast to come along with me. I actually think that ANCAP should split their ratings. There should be a crash test rating, i.e. how well the structure performs in a crash, and then a separate rating for active safety stuff. Yes. Because some people might not care that a vehicle doesn't have lane keep assist or, yep. or some, yep. of the, some of the more modern stuff. Really, at its core, shouldn't ANCAP be testing your likelihood of surviving an accident rather than... It's, well, it depends on how you define that. I reckon that's a really interesting point, Chester, because it's, more, it's not a crash test. It's an assessment. It's an assessment of the technology yeah. that's in the car, both active and passive, trying to help you avoid the crash and then survive it um, should one be unavoidable. Mm. Um, and it's not just a car into a barrier, and I think a lot of people, uh, that's just how they see yeah. it. And no, they would argue immediately that, like, their thing is to be able to, if, if they put those in the ratings, then it forces car companies to have them. And it's, it's no bad thing to have lane keep assisted. I mean, obviously, we all want AEB and that kind of thing. But their, their pressure to have those things included forces yep. the car companies to get on board. But you know, I, I, I guess I, the I, I argument... I agree with your idea, right? but I just, I'm thinking what they would say to that. I guess the argument I make, though, is I just think the ANCAP rating <laughs> system has become so confusing. So I'll give you an example. A car I'm going to talk about a little bit later, the, the uh, Hyundai i30 sedan, hasn't been uh, ANCAP rated. And the reason it hasn't been submitted is Hyundai basically know they're going to get a four-star result because it doesn't have a center airbag and some of the modern safety kit, yep. that, uh, the super modern safety kit that's now a requirement. However, right. so that car would carry a four-star rating alongside a vehicle that was tested in 2016, has almost nothing, and has a five-star five rating. Five-star rating, yes. And both those ratings are advertised alongside each other. Now, I know there's fine print underneath that says tested in 2016 or 2017, but does the average person or even us 
know the details of the requirements that change for each of those years. Yep. But yep. there's a lot of confusion in that system. It's yeah, a, it's all a, those questions is a website like Cars Guide that will tell you the answers. Yes, <laughs> join us. Well, I mean, the, the, the answer to that would be to test or assess every car every year. Yeah. Which yeah. Also, how can they not, not test it? How, it's how, just how, not practical. I mean, yeah, oh, we're not going to test that one because we don't want to get a bad score. Yeah, no, they submit it. But remember, um, so do do a. Uh, they can pluck them out of the lineup. So not not everything. They don't do super expensive mm. stuff, generally speaking. But if you don't submit a car for testing, ANCAP can go and grab one on their own and do it, which they sure. do occasionally. Of course, do. that's their prerogative. Absolutely. It's like lots of tests in school. I would have liked to not submit myself. For. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Cool. I don't think <laughs> yeah. I'll submit this one. Thanks. There was someone. That I, I actually <laughs> chose that option. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. I've, I've sidetracked this. <laughs> Even by the other standards. thing to mention, Chesto, when you talk about center airbags in the front. Um, just to split hairs there, it's actually a new side impact test coming from the passenger side that assesses things like head clash and, and what have you between the driver and front passenger. It's not actually mandating that you must have a centre airbag. What it is actually driving manufacturers to think about is how to make those crashes um, yeah. better from an occup point, occupant point of view. And often the solution is a centre airbag, but, but ANCAP is not mandating a centre airbag. I've never even thought about head clash, head clash and a side impact because both your heads would be going. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of action in there. There's a lot and of back. going on when when you're uh, yeah. crashing a car and never even uh, about heads that. banging together is is never good. It's not ideal. No, I'm getting, I'm, getting, I'm getting the feeling that no one's behind my uh, my. Well, I'm not, not. So people out there, the devil's advocate. That's all. Just the devil's advocate. <laughs> I need you listeners. Get on board. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, um, Peter Crott chimed in and said, I don't think people would cross shop a Mustang and a Stinger. Um, I and I think he's right. I think he's no. pretty right. Although they're both rear wheel drive, powerful cars, they do have a different purpose and they would find um, the Venn diagram of crossover between a Mustang and a Stinger, I'd say, would be reasonably thin. Uh, but he says every chance, though, that a Stinger could be cross-shopped by a 330i or even a C300, and he says kudos to Kia. So he's obviously a, uh, a fan of the Stinger. So he's 50% right, 50% wrong there. He's right that no one's cross-shopping a Mustang. He's wrong that people are cross-shopping a BMW. <laughs> 50 yeah, that's, that's a big ask in terms of your brand. <laughs> like if you're buying a BMW or a Mercedes, are you really going to – as good as that car is, I think it's amazing. But uh, I look at it and I look at the badge – if you take the badges off it, then you That's might right. wash off it. It's, With that badge on it, it's going to be tough for a German buyer to have a look at it. It's emotion versus, um, mm. you know, um, pragmatism. Um, yeah, correct. It's image. It's image. image. What's, what is going to make me look like? Not, like? not how good is it to try it? Yeah. I've always had a bit of a worry about the word, the, the name Stinger too. I, I'm not mm. a fan. It's not um, as bad as pro, but it's not far off. Yeah, true. Oh. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Now, Tom uh, White, who was in the podcast last week, was talking about his long-term Corolla hybrid ZR, so top of the tree Corolla-wise. And Zamuro came in and said, Corolla ride and handling balance is on point. And Andre yes. Vajur said, uh, Toyota Corolla looking good, but I prefer a wagon like in Europe. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm a wagon fan. Small wagons have really given way to SUVs that... that the, the choices there are, are very, very limited, but I do, I do like a wagon. They have, in fact, uh, trademarked the wagon name in Australia for the Corolla as recently as I think a little bit earlier this year, but the brand itself is still keeping mum on whether or not. In fact, they're saying at this stage we have no plans. They might just be covering their bases, but it's not completely beyond the realms of possibility that a Corolla wagon could join the fleet. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Very good. You could struggle, um, though, wouldn't you? Like, who, you know, that against a small SUE, I don't know. Mm. Mm. Now, in general, general feedback, uh, Sukhoi Romantic said, great podcast as always and enjoying the reviews too. So thank you. Ian Thomas, has to be the best podcast, just brilliant, exclamation ah. mark. Thanks, guys, with three thumbs up. So thank you very much, Ian. I know he's a regular viewer. Um, he hasn't heard now, this one yet. After all that, Senior Bob comes in and says, all caps, attention producer. Uh, <laughs> Please, can we have graphics to name each Zuma? Drunks can't remember who's who. It's Friday night, for God's sake. <laughs> it's always Friday night somewhere. I like that. So that's a, that's a shout out to Mr. Pritchard to maybe at um, irregular intervals uh, label who's who. Um, we're a name tag. 
We could we could wear a name tag. Wait, That's a nice idea. I'll I'll one. Bob, I actually uh, have worked out a solution to this problem, uh, and wow. that's to tell you to uh, lay off the sauce, mate. Oh, <laughs> what kind of that? Um, John Paul Cavillan uh, came at us and said, "Oh my God, Byron!" Now Byron uh, Matthew Darkus joined us a couple of weeks ago. He said, "I was falling asleep when you spoke about Mitsubishi. The amount of er uh, arms was amazing." Parallel. Your knowledge is fantastic, but you really need to supercharge the way you go about it. It was boring. And I know, I know that we had another comment that said, you know, um, he, someone had thought Byron had a stroke. And, and when we mentioned that to Byron, he said, I didn't realise the camera had slipped down to uh, view my crotch. Well, I immediately thought it was that guy on The New Yorker who lost his job. <laughs> That's right. So anyway, look, feedback received. Um, then Carlo Paolo Ramos says, hey, mate, hand wave, smiley face. Um, an all new 2021 Isuzu MUX has been released in Thailand. Please, please do a review of it. Thanks. Um, we would happily. The problem is it's just in Thailand. And yeah. it has <laughs> well, we go to Thailand. I'm <laughs> not sure you mean. Um, so it is, it, it is, in fact, due in Australia late next year. And um, it will have... All of the D, the new D-Max engines, four by four or four by two, um, yep. comfy suspension. Safety kit. That, that trick of swapping out coils for the rear leaves, more safety, all that. So yeah, it's heading our way uh, late next year. Carl, It'll be a good thing. We'll we'll go to town on it when it does arrive. Now Marco Vess has put up an interesting, what he's calling a thought exercise. Mm -hmm. One last internal combustion car to keep alongside your daily driver EV. Um, he says, should it be the MX-5? You know, the pleasure of working an engine through the gears to high RPM, lightweight package, all of that stuff. EVs won't be able to offer that. What about a muscle car, classic V8 rumble? Uh, or maybe, he says, in keeping with last week's episode, the Mitsubishi ASX, which will remain in production forever and we won't need to worry. So <laughs> That's also true. I did, I did uh, ask you guys to have a think about it and I wonder where you went with your last internal combustion car to keep alongside your, EV, your EV? Well, I'm going to kick this off only because I, I tend to agree. So whether this is a real ode to the internal combustion engine or not it, it is up to you. But I am actually in, the, in a quite a long and complicated process of convincing my wife to let me buy an MX-5. They are unbelievably cheap in the, in the latest generation. If you want to go back as far as 2015, you can get them now for under 20 grand in perfect nick, not a lot of Ks. In fact, I'm looking at one right now that's got 60,000 on the clock for 19 and a half grand. Yep. Uh, yep. The smaller right. engine, the 1.5. Is that a 1.5 or a 2 1.5 manual. Which, which is a very many, sweet car. The 1.5. Some, some would probably. argue is the best combo. Yep. Um, but for me, that is just a super pure, fun driver's car for yep. not a lot of money. If you're looking for a fun a fun car that really nothing's going to go wrong with, I, I think you can do a lot worse than a Mazda MX-5. So, yeah, look, I agree with it. Mazda MX-5 all the way cool. for me. Cool. Steve? Well, it's hard to go past an MX-5, but I prefer to live in dream world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I just drove a new 911 Turbo S down a runway at 300 kilometres an hour. I was quite fond of that. And I've got an Audi RS4 out the front that I would keep happily forever. But realistically, I would go for a second-hand Cayman, Porsche Cayman from back before they ruined the engine. And yeah. it has to be manual. And But in the real, real world, I'm also buying an MX-5. Okay. That's very good. That's very good. Um, I mean, we're, we're none of us are... Um venturing too far from, from Marco's thoughts. And I'm not actually venturing too far from your thoughts, Steve. I think it would be a 911 because Marco didn't give us a budget to stick to. So, um, <laughs> uh, look, I won't, I won't go the whole hog. No, I don't want a GT3 or, or I think just a Carrera S. Uh, 911 would be the internal combustion car I could stick with forevermore. Um, I just can I, can I throw names? Just a GTS, the wider, slightly wider. Slightly wider, yeah. Mm. Yeah, okay, fair enough. GTS it is then. Yeah. Can I throw one yeah. more honourable mention out before we move on? That we are now about, I think, about two weeks or, or at the very, at the most weeks away from the unveiling of the new Subaru BRZ. I think that's going to be pretty cool too. Uh, okay, that might yeah, be, good that, call. Yep. that might be and a fun farewell. If I didn't have to look at it, I'd have the Toyota Supra. <laughs> yeah, Supra's great. <laughs> fair call. Fair call. All right, now we will move on. Um, now, where are we? Finally, uh, oh no, close to finally, Adam Gill 
Lads, you need to do your research before talking about Tesla shares. Tesla is not valued as an automotive company. It's a tech company. Um, he also says, we haven't missed the boom. It's not even started. 2030 is when he'll be counting his dollars. So he's obviously a shareholder and he thinks there's a long way to go um, for Tesla shares. Uh, you know, in our defence, I think we have said from time to time that, that the market seems to value Tesla as more of a tech company than it does an automotive business. Um, but it's, it's a fair point, well made. We'll, we'll get to the Tesla share price a little later on and see what people are making of it currently. Um, and Ryle041 finishes it off with the dulcet tones of Peter's voice, and that's Peter Anderson, does things to me. So, okay. Peter, Peter, you're on notice, notice that Ryle041, whoever that may be, uh, is enjoying your voice. Let's put it Well, there. no, 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 he never said that. He just said oh, it does things, does to, does things to him. Who knows <laughs> to what him are. or her? Who knows? <laughs> Every time uh, I speak to ABC Radio, it's Peter Anderson. It's always him. I, I I'm frightened to listen to ABC Radio. <laughs> <laughs> now, we will now move to the main uh, topic of conversation uh, for this week. And, Chesto, you authored a story uh, yes. this week on Hyundai's ambition and their position as the ultimate disruptor. When you think about the, the pedestal that uh, the Toyota Land Cruiser sits on, they're wanting to, to rock that to the point where it might actually fall over. Can you fill us in on what you've discovered? Yeah, so let me briefly recap this for you. So rather than drill down too much on the will they or won't they, the, the, the brief version is that, look, they've been sort of hinting at a vehicle like this for ages um, at, at international levels, um, talking about really sort of a, a rugged ladder frame SUV is kind of the one missing link in their portfolio at the moment, that, that, and, of course, the, the ute. Um, but the two would potentially feed each other anyway. Uh, so, look, it's been heavily hinted at. No one has actually come out and said they're actually doing it at this point, although there has been plenty of global chatter about the possibility, et cetera. But rather than drill down on that part of it, we thought we'd drill down on the could they. Not would they, but could they do it? Could they really rattle the cage of, of a vehicle like the Turtle Land Cruiser? So at a recent hand day event, I, I put that to, that exact question to their general manager of, uh, of product, said, look, if you were to do this vehicle, would you be afraid of the sort of legacy that uh, you'd be coming up against? How, how would you possibly do that? Um, how, could you, how could you take on the titan of, of off-road? And their answer is, all you need to do is look at vehicles like the i30N, which really came into the uh, RS and GTI segment and sort of took it by storm, and also their ILO, which came into the high A segment and took it by storm, to realise that Hyundai does have the capability of getting into segments that they, they weren't previously in and making some real noise. And that, to be honest with you, that got me thinking. And, and the truth is, yeah, they can do that. If you yep. had told me 10 years ago or, or more that Hyundai was going to have a hot hatch to rival, you know, a Golf GTI or, or any number of other cars on a racetrack, I would have said, you're crazy. But look look where we are now, a growing in range that is really good, really proficient and, and tons of fun. So with that in mind, their argument is that, no, the legacy is not a problem. And to be honest with you, I tend to agree. Yes. I mean, the question that occurs to me is, I know we're talking about a, a body on frame, kind of a serious off-road capability kind of vehicle. Are they going to have a bit of a squeeze in the market, though, with Palisade being a, a very big um, multi-row um, SUV, irrespective of this potential new vehicle's off-road capability? They'll be pretty close in the market, wouldn't they? Mate, to be honest, I don't think they will be. Okay. So th they are pitching the Palisade as their flagship luxury, posh right. and polished SUV. Like it is, okay. it is destined, destined for the suburbs. It has all the kit and fruit you could possibly want, um, all, the, all their very best techs. I mean, basically, think of the Palisade as the closest you can get to a Genesis without buying a Genesis, essentially. Right. Right. Whereas this vehicle would be pitched very differently. This is the rugged, rough, off-roading icon that you would take on a tour of Australia that included, you know, crossing deserts, et cetera. So there yes. is a bit of gap there, I think. Yes. And that's a very new thing for them to do, though, isn't it? When you, what you're describing there doesn't speak to anything I know about Hyundai so far. But I think no. the question is, no, will they or won't they? But why wouldn't they? Like, yeah. you know, you're mad not to. It's like um, right. Samsung going, now we're going to stick with computers and fridges. We're not going to bother making phones. Yeah. We're not yeah. interested yeah. in that huge part of the market. That's right. And, and, and to be honest, I think if we've, learned, if we've learned anything from the i30N, it's that their first attempt at something is often a very good attempt at something. Like, I don't think it's going to take them too many run-ups to get started. I, if they do decide to do it, I think the first version will be everything they want it to be. Yeah. And look, I'm sorry if you mentioned before, um, Jesto, but it's in your story, you also mentioned uh, iLoad and, and yeah. HiAce. You know, you, right. think about, you think about how dominant HiAce has been historically in recent past. 
And you wouldn't have ever guessed that Hyundai could uh, take a crack at it. And that, that iLoad has been hugely successful for them. Yeah. Mm. So just for the sake of the listeners, let me tell you exactly what uh, Hyundai Australia actually said. They said there is a market here for that for an SUV like that, but there are always challenges with bringing a car like that to market, like the Land Cruiser brand name. We have the ability to overcome a lot of those challenges. I think what we've done with things like the i30N, challenging the traditional RS and GTI buyer mindset, has been very successful. And what we've done with ILO, challenging cars like High Ace in the segment that they've typically dominated, we've done a very good job of changing that mindset. So I don't think that would be a problem if we were to bring a rugged SUV to market. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, to be honest, it's hard to disagree. And they've got That's the runs true. on the board in those other two segments, so there's no, there's no reason to think they couldn't do it again. Yeah, does, does Chester always read out one of his stories when he comes to the book? <laughs> well, yeah. I imagine right. he does. Rather than hear it from me, let's hear it from the man himself. Well, wow. I mean, he, he he just needs to prove that he can actually uh, read and write, I suppose. Yes, like... <laughs> well, he didn't prove anything about the writing there, I don't think. But, uh, Unless he's remembered it by rote and just um, decided to kind of read it off to try and prove a point. Yeah, that's exactly uh, yeah. right. Now, I while we've got that, you, while we're talking about it for a second, yeah. let's get back to the could, would, not the could they, but the, but the will they, or more importantly, if they do. So we know, of course, we know the Land Cruiser 300 series now is all but confirmed to get this new 3.3 litre V6 diesel. Toyota says it'll outpunch the 200 series, which means pretty good numbers in, in torque and, and uh, power. So if, if Hyundai were to do it, they also have a pretty cool engine, the six-cylinder turbo diesel from the Genesis GV80, which is good for 205 kilowatts and 588 newton metres of torque. And when they reveal that engine, their R&D chief, Albert Beerman, the man, in fact, behind the i30 and former BMW and yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. the best person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he said that, uh, yeah, look, with this engine, there are so many applications. As you know, we, we can make commercial vehicles and so on. So it's an engine that will be out there for some time. So yeah. there is no – that that we think would be the engine that would power a top-spec ute. We, we also suspect it would be the engine that would power a, a, a ladder-frame SUV. Yes. I suppose it's also a question of the market opportunity in that mm-hmm. when you do have a car like Land Cruiser, the current 200 series, for example, that has such a great rep um, and tends to dominate – um, people thinking in that part of the market, how how big the segment might be, whether there's yeah. room to either expand it or or take some market share off that Land Cruiser. It is a pretty tough tough question. Well, you'd, have yeah. to one, you'd have to cut them on price, wouldn't you? I dare say. That's the thing. So, you know, to- the, the old Korean approach has just come in. We're just as good, but cheaper. Whereas now they just tend to match. We're just as good, and we'll be the same price. Choose us because we're great. Yes. So to, to put that into perspective, JC, that when, when we wrote that story, of course, we put it out on, on the Cast Guide social media channels, Facebook and the like, and there was a lot of feedback. And, and if I'm honest with you, about 80% of it was people saying, no chance, I'd never get out of, right. a, of, a, right. of a cruiser. Uh, plenty of people said they would. The only, the only grain of salt I would apply to, to all that feedback is that in, in my experience, much of it is from people who've never owned or <laughs> will never <laughs> own a Land Cruiser. Yeah. But still, you know, it, it's out there. And before yeah. the i 30 arrived, if you asked a bunch of uh, Golf GTI fans, would you even consider this car? The polluter said no. That's right, yeah. Well, that's true. I suppose also to your point, Steve, um, coming in with a, a, a more affordable option, um, Hyundai is of a scale where they can subsidise or you know, in, make an investment um, in a new model, but their cost of production has risen pretty appreciably uh, in the last decade and a half. So it may not, you know, an, an elaborate car like that, it may not be uh, the easiest thing in the world to make it cheap. Um, yeah. but you never know how far they'll go to invest in, in that kind of vehicle. Mm, no, true. Yeah. All right. Toyota's not, Toyota's not uh, afraid to get into a fight, I guess. Oh, too right. You know, you, they, their bag of tricks, they can reach in and pull out um, all kinds of things. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It comes to, if you want to have a punch up with, with Toyota um, in Australia, they're ready. Isn't it amazing that so many brands are sort of consolidating, joining forces, shrinking lineups, changing the way they do business? Yet every time you turn around, Hyundai's got a new product. Most recently, the Hyundai, Hyundai i20N, which I can tell you is a, is a, yeah, tons of fun. Yeah. Um, but yeah, their lineup just continues to grow. They continue to invest. So yeah, they will be a force. Yes. Yeah, I remember um, yonks and yonks ago being at Hyundai's head office in um, Seoul and the then uh, now uh, sadly disgraced chief executive of the business. We were in a in a conference room looking out onto the busy street that was was going past, and it was a peak hour. So one side was full of cars, the other was pretty pretty much empty, and uh, we were 
you know, talking about how thick the traffic was. And he said, look, my ambition is just to fill up the other side as well. Um, <laughs> just, but, uh, you know, even way back then, uh, there was no sure <laughs> ambition in terms of um, how many different models, what they needed to do su to succeed globally. So um, that that cultural uh, thing has has been maintained quite obviously. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I, I guess the big question is over to the listeners. I mean, send us some feedback. What would you take if if yeah. they had a, a really credible Land Cruiser arrival in the market? Yeah. Would you Would you be interested? Could it tempt you out? Yeah. Well, it'd be great if if we could hear from a Land Cruiser, current Land Cruiser owner or devotee. You know, what would it take to prise yeah. you out of your Land Cruiser and, and into a, a you know roughly equivalent Hyundai? Yeah. Well, the the thing yeah. I'm hearing. Well, <laughs> The thing I'm hearing more and more of these days, JC, especially in our comment sections, is something called the Toyota tax, which people yeah. are apparently getting frustrated with paying. And I, and I think the 300 is going to in, increase in price, obviously, new technology, new engines, you, you need to pay for that kind of stuff. So yeah. back to your point, Steve, if, if again, they would have sharpened the pencil on it, it might be uh, might be plenty tempting. Yeah. yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah, All right. Well, it again. People are going to cross yeah. off it. People look at it. It's yeah, basically like, what, like Mercedes team. launching a Ute or something stupid like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true too. Now we're gonna we're gonna now move to our own cars guide garage and vehicles that we've been driving recently. Steve, I'd love to kick it off with you, please. And it's a vehicle of a certain scale with uh, certain capabilities. Can you please give us the lowdown? I am occasionally driving a Ram Warlock, which I may have uh, I may have booked because I like the name so much. When they said it was called a Warlock, I thought they were joking and. Uh, and now I've got it and I'm driving it when I feel brave enough. It's, uh, I live in an inner city suburb where it's, it's, people look at me with fear when I approach them uh, because it's better <laughs> off the street. Yes. Uh, my but that's not like just in the world. That's, that's yeah. not just <laughs> in the world. Like they just, my daughter was in the back of the and she got scared because she was so far away from me. She thought I'd left. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh -huh. it's been a, it's been an experience, yes. And, and I, I really chose this car the wrong week when all, all I'm doing, trying to do is not think about America. And every time I can hit it, it uh, brings me back. But yes, it's, it, it's, it is so large. Um, I, 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 can't, I don't think I've ever driven anything as big as this. And it is a challenge in many ways. The, 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 ha the park brake you have to put on by um, raising your knee up to your nose and then poking with your toes. And then to get it off, you don't push it down. You have to find this uh, flap somewhere that feels about as permanent as, you know, something yeah. like a milk bottle lid. Yeah. All, these, uh, all these things are a challenge. But it, it does give you a certain... I think there is more hair on my chest, and my chest may even be larger this week. Not breast, chest. <laughs> nice. Well, the, the thing that surprises me, <laughs> not that I've been in the Ram 1500 for a while, I know, Chester, you have been reasonably, uh, relatively recently as well, is despite its, its overall size, the actual load space in the vehicle is, you know, it's good, but it's not particularly expansive. I, I agree. Like, it's all because cabin the passenger space, cabin's so big. The passenger cabin's cabin is enormous. enormous. Yeah, yeah. My, my kids were playing tennis in it the other day. Huh? My kids played tennis in it the other day, standing up tennis across the back seats. <laughs> but then that compromises the um, the load space. The load space, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus, All you have right. to be eight foot tall to put anything in it. And, and they, they they did do a great job of uh, of making them relatively car like. Though I spent some time in the new one that, that'll be in Australia shortly in the states recently, and I was amazed at how easy it was to drive over there. But the reality is the parking spaces are five times bigger than ours the, the, and the roads are five times wider. But even just like space aside, it was super car-like in the way it went around its business. It was good. Yeah. I'm sure it works in the States, yes. yes. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's a V8 petrol. Is that right? Steve? Yeah. yeah. And it's, but yes. Because of the enormous amount of weight that it's moving, it doesn't feel hugely powerful. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly well, well, really American. That's good. Thank you. And, and Chesto, we'll move on to you. We were just talking about Hyundai a little while ago, but uh, you've mm -hmm. been a different part of their model spectrum. Yes, sort of uh, near, the, near the start of the model lineup. So I just spent some time in, in the new Hyundai i30 sedan, which is a vehicle in Australia probably better known as the Elantra. Um, Hyundai sort of renamed it the i30, I think in order, for a couple of reasons, that they say in order to streamline their um, sales lineup. There is an argument as well that when you combine the two sales together, it'll make i30 one of the better selling cars in Australia, even though it is already, but it just gives them a better chance of being the best selling small car, I suppose. Yep. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's also very different. It, it is not an i30 hatch with a boot. It is a, a different platform. It's a different engine, um, different pricing, obviously, and a different lineup. So 
while the hatch maintains that entry level go price point, which I think from memory is around the 20 grand mark in order to lure people into the car, they've sort of foregone that with the hatch. It starts with the active, uh, which is uh, 26,790 with the automatic transmission, which is what everyone will go for, of course. Then it kind of steps up from there. It'll step up again to the inline manual. Uh, sorry, inline, pre- inline and inline premium models, which, of course, are the most expensive and most powerful. Uh, look, how would I summarise that car? It, it is, uh, and I, you know, it drives like an i30. The, the most challenging part of it, I think, personally, will, will be the design. It's a fairly adventurous design, especially the rear view. Um, it's a big basket of angles and shapes and, and yeah. grooves and swerves, and then the back sort of comes out and comes in again like a sort of like it's been indented. Um, so look, it, it's not to my personal taste. It's certainly adventurous, but I think that's probably the, the only real hurdle to climb. That and the fact yeah. that people don't buy sedans. You, you know, but, it's interesting. I think we've made the point in the podcast before that all of those angles and all of that complexity in the exterior design is quite expensive. <laughs> when yeah. you panels line up properly and you've got all of those intersecting planes and you're trying to wrap the surface and make it look good, that's typically confined to a, a more premium car than that one. Yeah. I think it's a bit of an investment in, and, and a roll of the dice on whether people will actually like it, but it's yeah. typically an expensive approach. But, mate, if I'm being honest, I, I did a range review for Cars Guide that hasn't been published yet, but, but across the hatch and sedan lineup in their entirety. So I had, the, I had a hatch and inline premium parked right alongside an active sedan. And to me, they are worlds apart in terms of design. The hatch is actually really understated. Um, right. it, it's like smooth looking. It feels very premium. And when parked alongside the sedan, which just looks like, again, you know, like very, very, very heavily designed, you can't help, in my opinion, you can't help but be drawn to the hatch. It also feels like a car that will be, the hatch that is, feels like a car that will be ageless, where you wonder if you're driving the sedan, a secondhand sedan in eight or 10 years' time, just how that design will grow, you know. But anyway, they're, they're coming after me. Remember, I bought an Elantra. I went off, my wife wanted an i30. I came back with Elantra and said, look what I got, fantastic bargain, I'm amazing. And she said, no, I wanted an i30. <laughs> she hated me forever. So now, now I've got it. I'm going to get me one of these i30 sedans and say, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. It'll be interesting to check in on that once you've had it for a little while. Um, now, I can chip in too. This week, I've been in the Jaguar F Type R. Um, it's in a pretty pricey part of the market. We're talking 265 odd K before you've put it on the road. Um, of course, it's a supercharged five litre V8, eight speed auto, 423 kilowatts, 700 Newton metres, which is plenty. Um, zero to 100, sub four seconds, it's 3.7 is the claim. So you're in territory like a 911 Carrera S mm. um, or all the other usual suspects, an R8, rear-wheel drive Audi. Um, you can have a Merc SL500 um, for roughly the same money. Thing is, this car has been updated. The F-Type has been updated in terms of ex- its exterior design and it looks even more beautiful in my humble opinion, always a subjective thing, but I just think it looks uh, amazing. This one was in black. Um, it's kind of a, a farewell love letter to the F-Type from, from Ian Callum, really, who's, who's left the, car, uh, the company as head of design, but this would have been under his watch. It's also ferocious, ferociously fast, and it sounds it. Um, it's also surprisingly sharp in terms of its uh, dynamics and really fantastic to drive. The seats, for example, grip you. It's a really terrific driving experience. I think on the on the negative side, just getting in and out of it is not as easy as you'd love it to be. I'm a man of a certain age, but uh, I, I'm still reasonably flexible, but it was kind of a yoga exercise to get in there. Um, it's only a two-seater, the boot's small, all of those things. It is going to be a special occasion drive, I would argue, more often than a daily driving prospect. Well, having said that, we did get a two suitcases in the back, a 95-litre one, a 35, 36-litre one. So it, it will take soft bags and, and other things for a cheeky weekend away. But I think it is absolutely a classic. This is a car that in time to come will be rolling over the auction blocks and people will be fighting each oh, other right. uh, to I grab think- it. I, I, think it's, um, I think it's terrific. It was uh, really special. Uh, I have to agree drive. that it is a, like it's had the best, that has the best rear end of anything I've ever seen. Oh, like, it's, it's just beautiful. It's a masterclass. Did it, but after I said, did it feel heavy? I always find that you know, it's got lots of power and whatever, but it just feels heavy. No, 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 I think it felt reasonably light on its feet. Okay. Um, and, yeah, no, didn't, didn't feel heavy. That's not something I walked away Which, from it thinking. Well, I must get me one of those. 
But I, I like, you know, you think about the SVR version, which has that big spoiler sitting up above the tail and it's, it's uh, overwrought. This one is, is beautifully subtle and the design is able to express itself without any kind of extraneous embellishment at all. It's, it's just lovely. This one was black. Had a, a very nice, rich, um, what's the colour? Kind of a terracotta, maybe a bit lighter than that interior in it. It just looks striking. Mm. Um, yeah, enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah, yeah. Callum. He's a good man, Callum. Uh, he is. So he would, is. You take, would you take it over the equivalent Porsche, JC? Hell no. Look, no, I don't think so. I think they're, they're different in their intent slightly. They're both meant to be fun to drive and they're both meant to be special occasion cars. But I suppose it's just the difference between uh, a Porsche and a, and a Jaguar. One, the, the Jaguar, you feel special um, in a slightly different way. You're cosseted in there. It's, it's, a, it's a lovely environment. The 911, it's more in the, the powertrain, the way the engine responds, yeah. all of those things. It's a different six-cylinder versus brutal V8 kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Easy, it's been much easier to get in and out of the Porsche. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> now, we shall move on. The most people's favourite segment, which is Musk Watch. Now, first of all, what would a US election be without a cryptocurrency scam involving <laughs> uh, Elon Musk and Donald Trump? So, the 2020 US president, presidential election campaign, now this is from Mashable Australia, authored mm -hmm. by a person called Jack Morse. He says it's still, to be, uh, it's still unresolved, and I think uh, we're recording this on Friday morning, and it, as we record it, it still is unresolved. Um, but Elon Musk wanted to celebrate. Um, and like so many country, countless times before, and this isn't the first time there's been a crypto scam, involving Elon, uh, Elon, he decided the best way to do it was to give away scores of cryptocurrency <laughs> via his Twitter account. Um, <coughs> that is, if the verified Twitter account with the display name Elon Musk was to be believed, it should not be believed, is what <laughs> Jack says. So what he was saying was, look, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. It's too complicated. I'm giving away cryptocurrency. Just go to this link and um, everybody will be happy. It's all decided now. It's all but decided now. Um, and he had put that, the, the person who had scammed this account and put Elon Musk at the top of it had responded to a um, Donald Trump tweet with this particular sentiment. So it's all happening. <laughs> if you see that, if you see that, uh, don't click on it. It's no. interesting because Twitter promised in 2018 that it would automatically lock any account that changed its display name to Elon Musk. But yeah. that didn't happen on Wednesday. Did they block Elon Musk's one? Were they right now? That has happened too. Well, so um, anybody who's high profile on Twitter seems to be a target for that. Can I just also point out, ladies and gentlemen, that billionaires are billionaires because they don't give anything away. There will never <laughs> be a moment when a billionaire randomly reaches out through the interweb and says, hey, have great, some money. Great point. That is a great point. <laughs> Didn't Andrew Yang offer to give every American money if they voted for him? I think that was his policy. <laughs> <laughs> what a wonderfully and refreshingly direct approach. Yeah. yeah. Why, why keep it under the table? Why not just, you know, bring it out into the open? That's um, right. Now, the Wall Street Journal uh, and author Andy Paztor has said that Elon Musk's SpaceX, and he's right, was dismissed by the Pentagon uh, during its early years. And I do remember an episode where Elon chose to share a marijuana cigarette with Joe Rogan during um, his podcast. And that didn't exactly uh, please. <laughs> it didn't help. Um, but now the billionaire entrepreneur and his company are enjoying more success than ever in snaring Pentagon business. In recent months, Mr. Musk's team has secured deals for everything from launching some of the nation's premier national security satellites to improving weather forecasting for the military to building a new generation of small spacecraft intended to track hostile missiles. So... Much as we get the kind of surface level treatment on SpaceX and, you know, going to Mars and putting a bunch of satellites uh, up in space, there's a whole bunch of skunk work stuff that uh, Elon is involved with behind the yeah. scenes. I hope Elon is the commander of Space Force. Well, you know, I think Space the guy's last... Launched, he's got to be in it. <sighs> he will, he'd look good in the uniform. Oh, uh, yeah. I would have yeah. thought. He'd find the uniform. Now, you the give other it a funkier thing, name than Space Force. I think you could come up with something funnier. That'd be better. <laughs> yes. Um, Spaceballs uh, comes to Space mind. Force. Now, 
The CNN has reported during the week uh, that Elon Musk tweeted, and we'll have a, um, a copy of that tweet up for people to have a look at who are with us on YouTube, that the company was within a month of filing for bankruptcy when it was struggling to bring its best-selling vehicle, the Model 3 sedan, to market. So quoting Elon, closest we got was about a month. He said when asked via Twitter how close Tesla got to bankruptcy. The Model 3 ramp was extreme stress and pain for a long time. Um, from mid-2017 to mid-2019, production and logistics hell. So there it was. And, I mean, we were podcasting yeah. through, that, through that period and just thinking, yeah, this has got to be close to um, a, a goners for, for Elon. And there it is. It was a month. Yeah. Do we just think bankruptcy would have stopped him? I mean, surely. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, yeah. just a small yeah, speed slow up. Slow it down. It's just, it's just a speed up. Mm. Donald Trump's been bankrupt four times, I think. Yeah, six. <clears throat> but who's counting? Who's counting? Um, <laughs> and in terms, in terms of um, the share price for Tesla, it's currently four hundred and twenty dollars, bit above it, and it was four hundred and ten dollars last week. So they're not not massive swings. It's still moving between this roughly four fifteen to four hundred and fifty a share. And I mm -hmm. read an interesting story through the week uh, from a, a, a site called Stock News, where they were comparing Tesla to Nikola. Now, Nikola is one of many EV-focused uh, startups that's creating a lot of buzz in the market and the stock market. Um, and they've asked the question, which stock is better to buy? Now, Tesla is into cars, trucks, batteries, solar, whole bunch of stuff. And Steve, we were talking before the podcast about how much Tesla is going to focus on battery storage as um, an income stream for its, its activities. Mm -hmm. um, an analyst's estimate that Tesla's earnings per share will rise to 68.3% will rise 68.3% next year. Now, Nikola at the moment is more into heavy trucks. Um, that's their thing, but they intend to expand as well. But the expectation is that their um, uh, share uh, earnings per share will rise 8% next year. Oh, wow. So not quite in the same league, and a rate of 21% per annum over the next five years. So they're currently $18.46 a share. So not, not exactly in the same ballpark, but, but kind of more palatable from, from a purchase point of view. Mm. Um, yeah. Some investors feel that Nikola can outperform Tesla when its products hit the market in one to two years, but some also believe the company won't be able to execute its vision, especially given its recent stumbles. And that stumble was founder Trevor Milton um, on fraud charges and allegations of sexual misconduct. So how strange no that might happen. Um, in a tech-focused business. <laughs> Anyhow, with that, I think we have reached the finish line. I want to say thank you, Steve. Pleasure. And thank you, Chester. Thank you, everyone. I'd also like to encourage everyone to support Movember. I have a vestigal uh, moustache uh, happening here for it's men's health, mental and physical. Are you sure? Uh, uh, mate, alarming that we're already six days in, JC. It hasn't exactly flown off the blocks that much. <laughs> I was going to say, it was. Oh, look, I'll get there. I'll get there. Start Give me a the morning. <laughs> um, are, you, are you prepping for 2021? <laughs> yes. We got the first I'll just week. keep going and see what now. happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd also like to thank our innovation Sherpa, paranoid in chief, and meme archivist, Mr. Pritchard, Mr. Pritchard for his production skills, patience, and fashion sense. Uh, today, he's wearing a t shirt saying, I wonder if beer thinks about me too. Beast pants and a pizza hat. Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, please rate and review us. That'd be great. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, my little nephew was showing off this week telling me he sleeps in a race car bed. Well, the joke's on him because I sleep in a real car. <laughs> I hope it's a Ram Warlock. He'll be very comfortable. <laughs> <laughs>